to say about Sarah Coakley? So first of all, Coakley is, a, Coakley is an Anglican theologian. So you all should be able to should be able to feel out some of the features that we sketched together in the latter half of last year's course on the spirit of Anglicanism. Um, she feels kind of quintessentially Anglican in many ways. Um, I'll leave it to you all in our continuing discussion to work out exactly how she feels Anglican in what way. So she is an Anglican theologian. So she's one of ours. She is uh, one of the most popular and important theologians working in the academy right now. Um, her book, which we're, will be our primary text this semester, God, Sexuality, and the Self, an essay on the Trinity, um, which many of us read at the very, very end of, um, well, we read parts of at the very, very end of the Anglicanism course last year. This was probably the most highly anticipated work of systematic theology in the last decade, if not two decades. Um, it's really hard to overstate the amount of anticipation within the Academy for this book. What I think is interesting for our purposes is that this book, as you guys will see, was written not simply for the Academy, but also for churches. And it'll be an outstanding question that we'll want to work through together, the success of her efforts to make it accessible to churches. But there are many things that Coakley does in order to make it accessible to informed lay people interested in doing theological reflection on issues like the Trinity and sexuality and gender, um, in particular for this book, and that would include all of you. So she wrote this book for you. She wrote it for me in both sides of my life, and she wrote it for you. We'll see exactly how that works out over the course of um, our read through. So a little bit about Coakley's, um, Coakley's history. So Coakley did, um, I'm trying to think about how far back to go. So Coakley wrote her doctoral dissertation on a theologian named Ernst Trolch. Uh, you, if that rings a bell for you, great. That'll help you play some of the things she does. If not, ignore it. Um, so there's a, um, that's her doctoral dissertation. After that point, though, when she really gets going is she works for the Church of England Doctrinal Commission. And the Church of England Doctrinal Commission puts together a document on the Holy Spirit. For this particular project that the Doctrine Commission uh, was tasked with, Coakley did a great deal of field work in actual parishes in England. She was a regular C of E parishes. And the field work that she was doing, she was leading contemplative prayer groups. And she began to find, in short, you can actually read the document, the write up. Um, it's not actually in her name, but it's commonly. Uh, commonly know that she was the primary author of this document. I think it's called, um, it's either On the Holy Spirit, or We Believe in the Holy Spirit, or I Believe in the Holy Spirit, something like that. You can get you a copy of that if you want. It's in an edited collection by Gene Rogers or something. Um, in any case, what she found doing, leading these contemplative prayer groups with parishioners in England, was that they had this experience that the Spirit began to pray inside of them. She saw an experience where they seemed to empty themselves of all their stuff, and then the spirit kind of, yeah, the spirit was poured into their hearts and began to pray for them in a certain <clears throat> way. You, basically in this experience of contemplative prayer, what you entered into was the dialogue between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This, is, this becomes her life motif. This is the field work that really set her on the course of the rest of her career. And we'll see exactly how that cashes out in God's sexuality and the self um, in a whole chapter dedicated to charismaticism and to this field work that she did. Um, so that was the early stuff. That's when she really gets going. She moves to Harvard from England. So she's trained in the British Academy. She moves to Harvard. At Harvard, uh, to hear her talk a bit, um, one of the things that she learned, being a part of the American Theological Academy, was the, important, uh, the importance of engagement with society and engagement in certain political issues. So an emphasis on justice and an emphasis for her on feminism. This is part of what she discovered at Harvard. Um, she's an interesting feminist theologian, though, because, as we'll see, She's in a fight, so to 
speak, within the discourse of feminist theology as to what exactly feminist theology ought to be. She has a very particular take on it, one which she's going to make very explicit uh, in the first couple chapters of God's sexuality and the self, so I won't rehearse it too much tonight. In any case, she goes to Harvard. She discovers the importance of social engagement being married to basically traditional, dogmatic, systematic theology. From Harvard, she goes back to Cambridge, where she's now the Norris Holtz Professor of uh, Philosophical Theology. So she gave the Gifford Lectures a couple years ago, and there's a whole strand of her work that feeds into those Gifford Lectures. The Gifford Lectures were on, um, I think I recommended them to Kevin at one point, um, they're on natural theology and evolution. And she did a quite a she did quite a great deal of research while she was at Harvard with researchers uh, in evolutionary biology, like um, oh, I'm forgetting his first name. His last name is Novak. Um, it's spelled N O W A K rather than N O V A K. In any case, um, she was working on this concept of evolutionary cooperation. And these evolutionary biologists were finding that. Um, just as we, you know, we typically think that in evolution, it's a kind of process of natural selection, you know, survival of the fittest, everybody's fighting and struggling and so on. What these researchers at Harvard were finding is that actually built into this evolutionary scheme is quite a great deal of what they were calling cooperation, what the rest of us would just call altruism. And so Coakley then tried to take the fact that evolution, it seemed to be evolutionarily beneficial to be altruistic, to cooperate. Um, and tried to give that theological point of view. And she did so by basically finding in that the watermark of Christ's crucifixion and sacrifice in creation. That's kind of what she was doing in her Gifford lectures. You don't see a ton of that, though, in God's sexuality and the self. Okay? There are kind of these two strands of her thought. There's this side, which is, um, which she, well, they're not just two. There are a whole bunch of them. She's got this side where she's doing this engagement with evolutionary biology. She's got this other side where she's really engaged in um, in addressing social issues theologically. In this book, Gender and Sexuality, in Volume 2 of her systematics, still projected, not published yet, uh, race is going to be the category that she, um, that she treats. So she's got that. She's very, very, as we'll see, um, very, very devoted to traditional, traditional doctrinal formula one way to put it. Um, she feels really orthodox, although we'll see in the first chapter of this book she has a particular understanding of orthodoxy, um, one that, you know, queries what exactly we mean by it. That said, I find her to be a remarkably creative thinker. She does seem to think outside of the theological box, as it were. She makes some decisions which are intuitive ones now living inside of the academy. We'll see if they're intuitive, actually, for people in the churches. I actually don't know if they really understand them to figure out. And then you also have this side of her, which is dedicated to infusing theological reflection with prayer, with this, these practices of contemplation, whose importance was pressed upon her by this early field work in parishes as part of this work for the doctrine of Mary. All that makes sense? Does everybody? So that's a little bit of her history. Oh. Last thing, she's got this side that does analytic philosophy of religion, which is what Jewel does. Um, yeah, why? Uh, she, there's a side of her that does analytic philosophy of religion, and actually her chair at Cambridge is for the analytic philosophy of religion. Um, so she's interested in questions about epistemology, how we know God. Um, so we'll see a little bit of that engagement in the very last chapter of God's sexuality and the self, but most of the intra-philosophy arguments she's having are, um, are not present in this book or at least they're um, more oblique than not. So, a little bit about her. Oh, last thing. She was ordained after she got to Harvard. She spends a great deal of her career, not as a priest. And then after she goes to Harvard, um, the way that she puts it is she discovers that there's a great deal, of, or there's a great many students at Harvard at that time who were really interested in ministry. Who would have thought? Divinity School to train new ministers, but <laughs> they found that the professoriate, for one reason or another, and this is her narration of it, I have no way of testing the 
let it be a bit dumb. But take her at her word. Um, the professoriate at that time at Harvard uh, wasn't engaged in those sorts of questions, and so she felt this. She felt that students kept coming to her for uh, projecting on her all these pastoral things. They expected for her to be this kind of figure to show them how to marry the life of the mind and ministry in the world. And over time, she began to realize, well, okay, so this might actually just be my calling. Um, it was a difficult thing, though, because uh, the C of E is much, was, has been much slower on women's ordination than the Episcopal Church has. So at the time when Copley was ordained, uh, women could be priests in the Church of England, but they could not be bishops. This was one of her. Uh, this is one of the things that she gets um, really, really, really mad about. Of course, now uh, the Church of England does ordain women as bishops. This is a recent development. But if you want to see Copley at her most angry, um, you should go read an editorial <laughs> that she wrote about the theological incoherence of the Church of England when they did not ordain um, women as bishops. This is a very, very angry. Yeah, they're working on it. Um, we're working on it. So she wasn't ordained until she got to Harvard. After that point, um, yeah, her, her ministry in the parish and in the academy, has, they've really been married for her. Um, in the book on race, um, the whole, yeah, basically the, the, the field work that gets that book going is her time as a chaplain in a prison. That's the, that's the field work foundation of the second book of her systematic the fieldwork foundation of this first book of systematics is that fieldwork she did for the Johnson Commission of the Church of England on contemplative prayer and charismatic anger. So, um, I'll take some questions about that in a little while. Um, what I want to do next, for the remaining part of my little 20 minutes, is I want to walk you through one of the early arguments that she made in an essay that really made her famous. Because we're going to see, if we can get some of these basic building blocks of her thought together, you will find it much, much easier to understand what she's doing in the prologue to God's Sexuality and Itself in her next year. So, the essay that really made her famous is on the concept of kenosis. It should be fun because um, we explored kenosis a little bit last year when we were working on the work of Charles Gore. So, uh, Here's a quote from a feminist theologian named Daphne Hampson, with which she opens up this essay. That kenosis should have featured prominently in Christian thought is perhaps an indication of the fact that men have understood what the male problem, in terms of hierarchy and domination, has been. It may well be a model which men need to appropriate, which may helpfully be built into the male understanding of God, but for women, the theme of self-emptying and self-abnegation is far from helpful to the paradigm. This is Daphne Hansen. So to remind you, the kenosis is the Greek word for self-emptying, or he emptied himself, found in the Christ hymn in Philippians 2. So Paul doesn't invent the Christ hymn, right? Do we, do we kind of remember what this Christ hymn is? Uh, the, the key line is um, that um, not seeing, some, not seeing uh, equality with God as something to be exploited, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. This is the description of what happens in the incarnation in this Christ hymn. The Christ hymn is a liturgical song, we think, that predates Paul by quite a long time. So it's really, really early. One of the earliest pieces of text that we have in the whole in the whole New Testament, according to historical tradition. So, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. <coughs> the emptying is just this word kenosis. So, Hampson's argument, Ham, yeah, Hampson's argument is that this emptying is a useful concept, maybe, for men, but it's not so useful for women. Now, we you see this over the course of um, you see this over the course of Copley's essay in people like Charles Gore. So let's remember what Charles Gore did with this concept of kenosis. So Gore thought that Jesus had to. Okay, so mm, how should I explain this better? Okay, Jesus has two natures. 
one divine, one human. The trouble with this picture is that its math doesn't work. 100% and 100, 100 and 100 are not supposed to equal 100. 100 and 100 are supposed to equal 200. But according to Chalcedon, 100 and 100 just equal 100. So this gives you a kind of conundrum. How in the world did the, the, does the divinity and the humanity of Jesus work together? Gore's solution to this, recall, was that Jesus' divine nature emptied itself of all its divine predicates, of all of its divine attributes. So the divinity was empty, basically just leaving Jesus to man, which is actually really popular. You hear Episcopal clergy talk about this all the time in sermons, actually. It's the kenosis is God empties out all of God's power, leaving just the human. Okay? The assumption made in this system is that these two things cannot work together. That divine power is the sort of thing that's like a battering ram. It has to get the humanity out of the way. The fear that Gore had was that divinity would overwhelm humanity, basically just leaving Jesus with one nature instead of two. So Gore's solution is, okay, we'll take the more powerful one, this one that's at the risk of overpowering the other, and we'll empty it. We'll, get, we'll say it, it's emptied of all of its power. That's the sort of canonic emptying that Hampson says is no good for women. Men maybe have all this power. Men maybe have power to batter and so on. And they might need to empty themselves. But women are in positions where they've already been emptied of all their power. Self-abnegation and self-emptying does nothing for them. What Coakley does instead is Coakley says that this is based on a particular construal of the kenosis first, and two, that it misunderstands the way that God's power works. So what she does instead is she uses, um, she uses in this essay on kenosis the Christology of some German Lutherans from the 17th century. I'm not going to go into it more than that. These German Lutheran um, theologians thought that the kenosis didn't happen with regard to Jesus' divinity. It happened with regard to Jesus' humanity. And Jesus' humanity brought itself, brought its will into alignment with that of his divine nature, which is really the end of all Christian life, to bring our wills in comportment with God's. So they thought that the kenosis happened on this side of the equation. That's the first thing that she does. Is she moves the kenosis to the humanity rather than the divinity. The second thing she does is she adopts another definition of kenosis, which is that um, they thought that um, you can understand Jesus' kenosis as not grasping after worldly power. It may be worldly power is a power that batters. It's a power that's over and against, right? It's a power that overwhelms. Jesus' kenosis, in that sense, is a power that doesn't grasp worldly power. It never takes worldly power. Coakley basically marries these two and says that the means by which Jesus' human nature stages its kenosis, empties itself to make space for the divine, is by not grasping after worldly power. You are trained to do this through contemplative prayer. Contemplation, and you hear Father Peter talk about this, and talk like this an awful lot, actually. I'm not saying he got it from Coakley. I don't think he did. But you hear Father Peter talk about contemplative prayer as self-emptying quite a lot. That's exactly what's happening in contemplative prayer, she says. You're emptying yourself. She calls it a, an intentional self-effacement, which she wants to distinguish from self-abnegation or self-negation. I'll read you a quote. If abuse of human power is always potentially within our grasp, how can we best approach the healing resources of a non-abusive divine power? How can we hope to invite and channel it, if not by a patient opening of the self to its transformation? 
What I have elsewhere called the paradox of power and vulnerability is, I believe, uniquely focused in this act of silent waiting on the divine in prayer. This is because we can only be properly empowered through prayer if we cease to set our own agenda, if we make space for God to be God. Prayer which makes this space may take a variety of forms and should not be conceived in an elitist way. Indeed, the debarring of ordinary Christians from contemplation has been one of the most sophisticated and spiritually mischievous ways of keeping lay women and men from exercising religious influence in the Western Church. We want to talk about that a little more. Such prayer may use a repeated phrase to ward off distractions, or it may be bold and silent. It may be simple Quaker attentiveness, or take a charismatic expression, such as the use of quiet rhythmic hums. What is sure, however, is that engaging in any such regular, repeated waiting on the divine will involve great personal commitment and apparently great personal risk. To put it in psychological terms, the dangers of a too sudden uprush of material from the unconscious, too immediate a contact of the thus disarmed, self-effaced self, with God. These dangers are not inconsiderable. Whilst risky, this practice is profoundly transformative empowering in a mysterious Christic sense, for it is a feature of the special self-effacement of this gentle space-making, this yielding to divine power, which is no worldly power, that it marks one's willed engagement in the pattern of cross and resurrection, one's deeper rooting and grafting into the mind of, into the body of Christ. Have this mind in you, wrote St. Paul, which was also in Christ Jesus. The meaning of that elliptical phrase in Greek still remains obscure, but I am far from being the first to interpret it in this sense, this have this mind within you, the same mind which is in Christ Jesus, as a hidden self-emptying of the heart. If, then, these traditions of Christian contemplation are to be trusted, this rather special form of vulnerability is not an invitation to be battered by God, nor is its silence a silencing. If anything, it builds one in the courage to give prophetic voice. But choosing to make space in this way, one practices the presence of God, the subtle but enabling presence of a God who neither shouts nor forces, let alone contemplates. No one can make one contemplate, though the grace of God invites it. It is the simplest thing in the world not to contemplate, to turn away from that grace. Thus the vulnerability that is not about asking for unnecessary or unjust suffering, though increased self-knowledge can indeed be painful. Nor is it, in Hampson's words, a self-abnegation. On the contrary, the special self-emptying is not a negation of the self, but the place of the self's transformation and expansion into God. There are a couple things you're doing in that passage. This is what's going on. Okay, We're emptying out our human natures by ceasing to grasp for worldly power. We cease to set the agenda in this sort of prayer, train ourselves in ways that gently efface ourselves, erase them, some fashion, make them translucent, transparent, and vulnerable to God, and when we do that, God's power, God's gentle power, she insists, floods us and empowers us to do, well, all sorts of things. She refers here to giving prophetic voice with it. So this is one thing. Uh, she, she's trying to marry the contemplative and the active life. The Vita Contemplativa and the Vita uh, which is a traditional problem when you're struggling with mystical theology. It's something that our year-long course on the mystic way is going to struggle with, too. She wants to say that subjecting oneself to God, submitting oneself to God in contemplation, is the source of all one's energy to live a truly active life, indeed to work for justice. Now, the effects that this gentle self-effacement, the making of oneself, the making oneself vulnerable before the gentle non-battering divine power is something that she's going to be concerned with for basically the whole of God's sexuality in itself. Um, its effects are pretty radical. Um, changing you from the bottom up has a great deal to do with uh, one's gender and the nature of one's desire and one of the ways she thinks through what how she thinks through a robustly theological account of what gender and sexuality actually are. 